You're on. My name is Beverly Sanders, and today is Friday, October 21st, 2016. I'm visiting today with Preston Trimble in his office in Norman, Oklahoma. Joe Sanders will be assisting with the recording equipment and sometimes adding his own question. This interview is for the historical records of McFarland United Methodist Church, as well as the Voices of Oklahoma United Methodist Project of the Oklahoma Conference Oral History Research Program. This research program is coordinated through the Commission on Archives and History with the support of the Oklahoma United Methodist Historical Society. Preston, I just certainly appreciate your taking the time out to visit with us this morning and share some of your memories and your uh, activities in, in the Norman and, and the uh, McFarland Methodist Church. And so um, I'm going to just kind of ask you if you would begin by telling us about yourself, uh, introducing yourself, your, your family, your upbringing, tell us about your education and uh, kind of all, all that stuff that makes you Preston Trimble. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, I uh, was born in a log cabin, which is actually a fact. Uh, where I was born in Oklahoma was uh, is now under the the uh, Marker Ferry Dam really? Lake. Uh -huh. and, and where was uh, that? Where is it? It was near Salina. It's Wolf Creek mm -hmm. near Salina, Oklahoma. And uh, we, uh, we were Okies and moved to California when I was very young. I don't know how old I was, but the, uh, we moved. Uh, have, you, have you read uh, The Grapes of Wrath? Yes. That's the, it uh, was our Jodes. Uh -huh. You know, we ended up at a work camp in Arvin, California in the San Joaquin Valley. And uh, then uh, we would move back and forth from Oklahoma to uh, California, and I uh, some of the fun, some of the memories I have of uh, California is that uh, this is a church activity, and I had no church background at all uh, when I was about nine or eight or nine years old a couple older women took me to church they were probably 15 or 16 <laughs> and uh, I was uh, baptized in the Church of Christ and it, when you're baptized in the Church of Christ you are baptized you know? <laughs> they hold you down <clears throat> yeah and so anyway but I never went back to church I, I, I had no background in church at all and uh, so uh, we kept going back and forth in California, and uh, I graduated from high school in Pryor, Oklahoma. Oh. And then I was, I got a scholarship to uh, the University of Tulsa, and uh, I, I, worked in the public relations office over there and I had a night watchman at, uh, a job at KTUL and it had uh, TV stations back in those days had a kitchen and had food shows and I yes. could eat there and, mm -hmm. and, and I had a, a apartment, garage apartment, all I did was mow the ladies yard, maintain her yard for that. But I was uh, supporting a mother and two sisters, and I couldn't uh, couldn't make it. So I, I joined the Navy because I had the GI Bill, uh -huh. and uh, so Mrs. Uh, German was my sixth grade teacher in uh, Bell Gardens, California, which is an oaky slum. And she said that you can get out of here if you work real hard, apply yourself, and uh, you're nice. <laughs> People don't know how smart you are. They don't care how smart you are. They don't measure you by how smart you are. They measure you, and you have no control over how smart you are. Absolutely zero control. God gives you that birds. 
those uh, brains. And uh, so, but you have 100% control over how people measure you, and that's how nice you are. It's a very interesting mm -hmm. philosophy, I it thought. It sure is. So, at any rate, uh, I got in the Navy and got the GI Bill. When my war was Korea, yours was Vietnam, right? Mine was Korea, and uh, the then I uh, came back to. Well, the folks had moved back to California by that time, so I had dual citizenship. I could either <laughs> go to uh, Oklahoma as a citizen because I'd graduated from prior high school, or I could go on to. USC and UCLA, and uh, I was discharged in Treasure Island, San Francisco, and came down to uh, Los Angeles, took uh, just too many people. So I came to Norman in 1952 and uh, liked the school and, and haven't left since, so I've been here ever since. My uh, uh, church background uh, doesn't e exist. I probably went to, to church uh, a couple times while I was in the Navy just to break the routine. And uh, my original wife was a Methodist, so we were married in the Methodist church in uh, Lawton. And, uh, <clears throat> but we didn't go to church. And so, uh, when the kids started coming along, I thought they ought to be exposed to Christianity. And so I started taking them to uh, McFarland Church. Dr. Crutchfield was the pastor at the time. And so, you know, I, I got active. I, I was a usher with uh, uh, Saint Robert St. John and and then I had the MYF by myself for four or five years, and, mm -hmm. and then I became lay leader and, and just working my way up. And, and uh, one Christmas, I heard a noise outside, and I went to uh, the door and opened it up, and, and there were a bunch of hippies there. See, I was, a, I was a county attorney at the time. During the Vietnam War, people were measured by whether or not they had long hair. And, uh, so, and I was the prosecutor, chief prosecutor in, in, Oka, in uh, Cleveland County. And so I grew a beard and a mustache <laughs> to show that just because you're uh, a pig prosecutor doesn't mean that you're a, a bad guy. Mm -hmm. So anyway, there's kids were out there, and I was teaching a college-age Sunday school class at the mm -hmm. time. Uh, and Reese Allen is, was one of my students. He's oh, active oh. in the uh, men's prayer breakfast. Mm -hmm. and so uh, I was uh, MYF, Usher, lay leader, and I'd never read the Bible. And so these kids were there, and they came in, and we visited for hours, and they brought me a Bible, a living Bible. And they said, uh, uh, well, start out with Matthew, and, we'll, and I said, uh, no, I'm going to start at the beginning, and I'm going to read all the way through. And that was in the early 60s, and I read the Bible every day uh, except uh, on Wednesday mornings when I go to the men's prayer <laughs> breakfast. And uh, it's, it's a way of life, you know, to read the Bible. And so the uh, kids were active in the church, and uh, that's how I, I got active in. And, Start the the uh, Jim Cocklazer was a youth director at McFarland, and Carl Fazer, who was a, a colonel, Marine colonel, uh, was a ROTC Navy ROTC commander, uh, 
And so one uh, Holy Week, uh, we had services for the week, for the week. And different people were involved in the uh, first, first uh, one, oh, uh, Ray Matlock, B.E. Massey, Colonel Fraser, Bob Pendarvis, me, Herbert Adams, Fred Seals, D. Mosca, all of these names were in the first. Tuffy McCall was mm -hmm. one of them. And uh, so I thought, I thought, well, that'd be a good idea if we had uh, a church men's prayer breakfast. And so that we have had uh, every Wednesday prayer breakfast at McFarland for over 50 years. And, it, you know, if you go to a gas station and it's closed, you don't mm -hmm. go back. Yep. And so I've made sure that somebody was there cooking breakfast every Wednesday for more than 50 years. Except when we got locked out a couple of times. <laughs> Except when we got locked out when they changed the locks uh -huh. <laughs> on the church. But, you know, <clears throat> Back in the old days, we didn't lock the church. Yeah. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, uh, my original wife who was a school teacher and a counselor, and uh, she was afraid of tornadoes. And so uh, we were going to McFarland as a, a, down in Meyer Hall as a tornado shelter. Oh, okay. And we're, we're, we're driving to the tornado shelter one night and a tree blew over and and uh, <laughs> rode in front of us and I said we got a better chance of staying at home or going to the t tornado shelter and get killed on the way there so uh, oh. hmm. we quit going to the tornado shelter and <clears throat> the uh, I guess that covers my activities. The, um, well, let's um, I'll go back to your education. You went to OU. You came to came Norman to OU. Yes. And uh, where did you get your law? OU. You went got that at OU also. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I got a, a Buddy Pendarvis was the assistant county attorney, and uh, when his Bussy went to the Court of Criminal Appeals, Pendarvis became uh, the county attorney. And uh, in, I started to work for him in January of 61. And then in March of 62, he joined the Luttrell firm and the county commissioners uh, uh, appointed me to be the county attorney. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the next term, I ran for the office and, and won the office. And <clears throat> John Yarrington was the choir director at McFarland Church. And in one of my campaigns, uh, they, uh, John was leading the choir, and whenever it came to and he made me tremble, tremble, <laughs> tremble, and John turned and looked. At me. Oh, uh, oh, 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 yeah. We we didn't get to know John Yarrington very well. He was leaving just as we came back. To he went to Dallas. Yeah. And, uh, mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, go ahead and tell us, uh, you, you've just kind of mentioned in passing, but let's go ahead, we were talking before we started, tell us about uh, being uh, the different uh, county attorney and different things like that and when you were judge. That was, uh, I was the last assistant county attorney, the, the uh, last county attorney and the first district attorney. And about when, when was this? It was in 67, okay. 67. Mm -hmm. They went to... Uh, state, county, I mean district uh, attorneys. And it was funny, it was a guy named Bobby Battle who was, uh, he, there was a, a, 
prison reform, and Bobby Battles was the plaintiff in this case for prison reform. And uh, Bobby was uh, uh, burglarized a, a jewelry store in uh, uh, Moore, and uh, uh, the police officer kicked in the door, got the evidence, the sack full of uh, jewelry from Bobby. And, and so it was illegal search and he was unable to use the stuff. So I, I said, uh, uh, I'm not going to prosecute you, Bobby, but uh, do not mess around Cleveland County again. Do not take steal somewhere else. <laughs> and so the, uh, the uh, district attorney system came in and I was elected district attorney, which took in Cleveland, McLean, and Garvin counties. And sometime during that first year, uh, I went into the courtroom in uh, Paul's Valley, and uh, Bobby Battle said, what are you doing here? I said, uh, well, Bobby, uh, you've, you're running a, a had a, a group of people would boost from a from department stores. They'd go in, put on clothes, and leave with them. And you know, under anyway. And uh, I said, uh, got a district attorney system now, Bobby. You're within my jurisdiction. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh -huh. We had a prison prison uh, conference in McAllister. This is several years later, and uh, I'm in the yard talking to people, prisoners, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I hear this voice said, "Hey, Preston, what are you doing here?" <laughs> and I said, "Bobby." He said, "Yeah, yeah, I'll be right there." And I said, "What? Well, you'll be right? Hey, I know how to get out of this place." So anyway, he came out in the yard. And he, and he said, uh, Preston, get off of that table. I was sitting on the table answering questions for these guys. He, Bobby said, get off that table. And so I got off the table and Bobby said, that guy's running the card game on this table and you're interfering with his business. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, oh. and, and, uh, Bobby and I had a relationship for a long time. Uh, he he didn't steal anything more from Cleveland, Garvin, and McLean County, <laughs> as far as I know. Yeah. Okay, then let's let's go back to McFarland. Then you've talked a little bit about McFarland and uh, how you happened in there. Uh, and now, uh, most of the time you were at McFarland, you were married to your first wife. Is that correct? Yes. And. Uh, you said that you've said that your um, main involvement was with the youth and the, the MIF, the youth groups. Were you on any of the church committees or anything? The education, the no, uh, not, board not that industry? I recall. No, yeah. I was. So you you were really working with the youth, is what you were doing. Yes. And yes. I said it says that you were active in, with the youth with MIF. Can you, MIF uh, Methodist Youth Fellowship. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that would have been in the early sixties. Early sixties. If, if it happened before yesterday, it, I, I can't remember. Yeah, some, you know, sometime you know, in the, in the, the 60s. Then. Yes. You mentioned yes. your daughter was also involved in the choir and the uh, bell choir. Bell choir, bell choir. yes. Did you talk about that? You might want to cover, uh, you were probably there when they had the first scan light services. I don't know. I don't know. They I last year at, at the Christmas, uh, they, they celebrated the 50th anniversary of the candlelight service, which was something John Yarrington started. And uh, I, I, I kind of got the know. idea that was early, early on in the chapel choir. You did say your daughter though was involved in the bell choir. She, bell choir, yeah. She mm -hmm. would have been probably playing. Well, I again, I thought those kids ought to be exposed to the uh, church, and it worked for one of them, Amy, who was in the church choir, married the son of Baptist missionaries, and. Uh, they are 
Dr. Dr. Mark, well, he he closes at uh, yeah at, uh, at Holy Week services. He uh, so I work with her, but the other two didn't stick. No, yeah. But at least they were exposed, uh, which is uh, something I wasn't exposed to. Tell us about being lay leader. What does a lay leader do? Uh, whatever Poe Williams told me to do. <laughs> you know. uh, so so Poe Williams was the minister all the time. You were lay leader. Uh -huh. Yes, ma'am. Is that when you made the, when you preached that one time? Pardon? Is that where you when you did the preaching that time? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I I had uh, like I said not read the Bible. I was lay leader, and, and uh, I I had uh, tried to give a lay leader's opinion of Christianity and I, I think the, the main pitch of what I was giving was that yes we believe that you know the resurrection and the life forever and etc but just comparing Christian I mean religious leaders and stuff, following Christ's uh, instructions and pattern makes us all better people. Forget the, the resurrection and, mm. uh, and that, just but it'd be a better world for, for us just to follow his mm -hmm. lead. And was your, was, that, was, your, was your sermon given in the regular sanctuary service? Uh, oh yeah, just to... yeah. I, I did it more than once. I don't, I don't no, know. Yeah. Yeah. So, but that was the one you remember. Yeah, Poe Poe had a, a unique approach to life. His uh, dad w lived on a farm, and I like he was in his nineties or something like that. And uh, uh, Poe's sister called and said, uh, Dad, we've got to get Papa off of that track. He's out on that tractor every day, and he's 90 or early 90s or something. And uh, uh, we got to get him off of that. And Poe said, Sister, if you figure out some place that would be better for Papa to die, I'll do my very best to get him there. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. he, he was. A, he was a, a lay leader's dream. Uh -huh. I thought Paul Williams had a very high regard for him. Yeah, we, we've heard an awful lot of good things uh, said about Poe Williams. We never knew him ourselves, I, at least I didn't. Yeah. No. But uh, a lot of people have had good things to say in our interviews about him. Yeah. Um, you didn't follow up. What are your children doing now? Uh, Todd, my son, works for IBM and has for 25 or years or so. And where is that? And in Dallas. He's uh -huh. in Dallas now. And uh, Beth is a PhD and she is a professor at uh, UCO, U University of Central oh, yeah. Oklahoma. And uh, Amy is married to Dr. Mark. I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I've Fortunately, I was the first one to graduate from college in paternal or maternal backgrounds. And uh, my, uh, Todd was the second one to graduate, and Bethy was the third, and Amy was the fourth. So the, I, I was following Mrs. German's advice. Yes. Oh, your, your teacher back in California. Sixth grade. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You suppose she'd be, she'd be pleased to know that her advice stayed with you that long and influenced <laughs> you that much. Well, I hope so. wonder if she has any idea or had any idea. I, I don't know. That was in the, in the 39s or 38s or 40s or somewhere yeah. in there. And so I, I, but I, I remember her. It, you, you know, it's it, it, the Aside and apart from your family, okay, the person, most 
influence on your lives, or at least my life, was a school teacher. Oh, yes. That's how important they are. You know, to Patty, my wife, uh, taught school for 25 years. And Anne, my original wife, taught school forever. And uh, the, uh, Patty corresponds with students from Lebanon to Long Beach. My goodness. I mean, that's how much mm -hmm. of an impact a teacher has. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's critically important we you know, support. Children probably teachers. don't have as, as much chance to have one specific teacher uh, anymore since the, with the constantly changing classes and going through several teachers in a, in, in a day and they probably don't get a chance to really be with the, that one teacher as much as they used to, do you think? I, I, uh, I don't know, but I think it depends on the teacher, you know. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you have to have teachers that, uh, well, Pat, Patty was raised by the nuns, you know. And of course, she taught at Kennedy School, oh. and uh, Kennedy is one of the. It's an open, oh, yeah. it's one barn, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, so that they they had a, a meeting every morning in the in the gym, and you could tell where old lady Piercy's or old lady Tremble's uh, class were. They were there, quiet. Uh -huh. Silent, you know, obedient, etc. Yeah. And uh, that, well, that's one way of teaching school, anyway. Mm -hmm. But she has an interest in those kids. Oh yes. Again. Um, let's go to a, a, your memories of some of the particular um, staff members or people that were leading McFarland during the times that you've been here. Uh, before I mentioned Poe Williams, did any other ministers stand out in your mind? Uh, yeah, uh, Bill Haynes. He oh, yes. was the assistant preacher, or whatever they call him mm -hmm. at that time, and uh, he he had uh, he was very active in the uh, men's prayer breakfast. As a matter of fact, whenever we first started it out, we had uh, uh, preachers on the list, and if you note today, we don't have preachers on the list. They're in the the column. They're, we mentioned their names, but they're not on the list. Too, yeah, and uh, the reason we don't have preachers on the list is because Bill Haynes brought post-dosties <laughs> to eat for church breakfast. <laughs> and it didn't sell very well, so uh -huh. uh, he may have done that on purpose, Bill and Bill. <laughs> no, so he would get called again. <laughs> Uh, show it, us the uh, the two little booklets that Bill wrote. Uh, oh yeah, he's uh, he wrote turn, the, turn around so that he can see the the, the yeah, heavenly there. fish fry and fishers for men. Yeah, I guess so. I go ahead. Yeah, that's okay. The uh, heavenly fish fry is uh, has citations from uh, please help me Romans eight twenty nine to thirty. A smile, even through the years, Matthew 5. How about them apes? Second Chronicles 9.21. And that's what this is, this a heavenly fish short, fry. Short devotional, daily yeah, thoughts. Yeah, short devotional. Mm -hmm. And uh, this one has, uh, uh, is, is just boys, pigs, and love. When Luke was writing the book that bears his name, he remembered three stories Jesus told about stuff that was lost and called it chapter 15. <laughs> and it's full of fantastic, If even if you think Paul is too much, a fellow can preach like that can't be all bad. <laughs> Just he had a kind of a wry sense of humor, didn't he? He did, a very wry uh -huh. sense of humor. How about any, any others that uh, you think of? Uh, I, uh, I think the the uh, Reverend Coffin was about the last oh, mm -hmm. when I first finally whenever whenever Amy left McFarland uh, then and and old lady Piercy uh, died 
Well, we didn't have to go to McFarland and then go to Catholic Church. Uh -huh. yeah. And so we uh, uh, just started going to Mass then. Yeah. And of course, I couldn't take communion. Uh, well, it, it's, if you're not a Catholic, they encourage you not to take communion if you're not a Catholic. No, I like the Methodist Church. <clears throat> so Patty, Patty and I were married by a judge. We applied, we asked him to get uh, uh, married in the Catholic Church, but they declined because I'd been married. And, right. uh, and so uh, we, we started going to uh, Mass at St. Thomas More, and uh, the uh, we took the family to Rome, and in John Paul's last midnight Christmas midnight mass, we attended that uh, mass, uh -huh. and with Doctor uh, Doctor Mark, he went with us, and Bethy, and Patty, and me went, and uh, they had an aisle right down St. Peter's, uh, uh, and and. Uh, Time for communion. Well, they had priests going up and down the, the communion uh, there, giving communion, giving communion, and so Patty took communion, and so I walked over and like this, which means just give me a blessing, don't give me the host, and so I walked up there, and the, the priest gave me a host, and I find out later that that's just the U.S. deal. Oh. It doesn't, hmm. apply there, doesn't apply in St. Hmm. Peter's. So anyway, and then that Easter, Father uh, Pruitt was uh, at, w passing Holy Week around, you know, the and splat. So <laughs> I tell uh, my buddy that I took communion and then I was baptized What's next? Well, I was talking to Alan Veeley, who is a Jew. He said circumcision was next, <laughs> so I declined that opportunity. And so Father Pruitt said that he would uh, uh, confirm me any time, and uh, 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 marry Patty and me in the church any time. I said. Well, let's do it at corporate headquarters. <laughs> so we went to uh, Rome and Father Pruitt and uh, uh, we, were, we were married at St. Gregory's Chapel in, uh, at corporate headquarters. Mm. Okay, That's, you've, you've mentioned John Yarrington. Yeah. Uh, any other music people that caught your attention? It's been 30 years yep. or more since I was and, there. And you said the daughter was in the bell choir. She was in the bell so choir. So they did obviously have the bells started by that time. Yes, mm -hmm. uh -huh. Amy. Did they have a lot of different choirs then as they do now? Uh, different age groups? Uh, no. The, well, they had the MYF and uh, in Meyer Hall. We met in Meyer Hall every Sunday. Mm -hmm. And you know, like uh, sometimes when I give the devotion at the men's prayer breakfast, I get people to get together, hold hands, make a circle. Mm -hmm. well, that's what we did every Sunday uh, yeah. with those kids. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I uh, times changed a lot oh, since yes. those days. Uh, as as a matter of fact, I had a sock hop in Meyer Hall. Bob Barry Sr. was the disc jockey, oh and uh, that did not meet approval. Of <laughs> uh, I can imagine. Well, yeah. no, I can imagine that. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the kids liked it. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I had a, had a Sunday school teacher in Oklahoma City that used to get after my th sisters and I because we would go to the movie on Sunday afternoon. And, uh, so, um, moving on then. Uh, we thought we, Joe and I, uh, thought particularly about Gene Powell and Hoyt McCarty, his office staff. Did you know them? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us, tell us a little bit about either, either or, and. <laughs> well, uh, 
Jean's husband uh, was a builder in Norman, yes. and you can you could tell his houses everywhere because they're kind of, they're modern quote modern flat roof, you know. Uh -huh. you could, and uh, and then Hoyt McCarty. Uh, she lived up on Chautauqua, I think it was. Some she did what? Lived on Chautauqua. Oh, I'm not sure. Street. No. Yeah, I can't uh -huh. remember. Right near the church. Yeah. But uh, any any thoughts about their role in the church and any any particular brushes you had with uh, with them? Uh, well, one of the, the the questions that you had mentioned in your uh, list about the. Uh, role of women yes. in the church. Mm -hmm. uh, back in my day, uh, that was very limited, S yes. this support staff. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had started the, uh, uh, the daycare center yes. early on, and women were kind of in charge of that. Right. But the leadership, act, uh, they weren't. They weren't. No. Well, that was true of uh, mm -hmm. uh, that, that was true of all phases of life, not just only the church, but their their the court clerk was a female, nobody else. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. there were no judges, female judges. Mm -hmm. uh, there was one deputy sheriff, Blanche Giddens, who was. Uh, who served to process papers, and that's it. I mean, it was... Mm -hmm. Women were chattels back in my day. And they, they could be secretaries and, and teachers. Uh, helpers and teachers, yeah. but not, not the, the leaders of the group. No, mm -hmm. certainly not the, the yeah. preacher oh, in the oh, Mad yes. Imagine Methodist that. Church, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Yeah. And well, I, Linda's the first preacher ever in McFarland Church. I believe. I'm, she is. Let's see, I'm trying to think. Have we had any associates that were women? I don't no. believe so. No. We've had we've had several women that have been ordained that were Methodists, but they didn't come back to McFarland. Mm -hmm. No. You know, along that line, my fifth grade social studies teacher in Oklahoma City, when we came to talking about women voting, uh, her comment at that time was. Well, the women may not have gone to the polls and voted, but you can be sure that they discussed it with their husbands before their husbands went. <laughs> and <laughs> and you know, I just, it's funny, I remember that, that for all the way from sixth, from fifth grade, but uh, yeah. okay. Um, so nothing in particular about, no, no, of the, Jean Powell was apparently quite a character in the office and uh, uh, so no, no particular brushes with, with her and her. No, no. Uh, so, okay. Uh, and you've talked, you've mentioned then the role of women, so if we need to say anything more about, about that. Well, uh, my life has certainly changed since I married that Catholic. Mm -hmm. Tell us about <laughs> she, it. That's, that's well, an interesting she switch. Thinks, uh, she thinks it's an equal partnership. That's <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> you know, back, back when I was a kid, women were really chattels, you know. Had no role at all except taking care of kids and having kids. My mother, uh, by the time she was, well, let's see, I was born in 30 and she was born in 11. She was 19 when I was born and she already had, had one that uh, I had a sister that died in a flu epidemic. And so, and then, and then uh, she, she had her fifth child when in 1940. What would that make her? 29. See, and uh, it was a different world then. And and I I I I tried to raise my two daughters so that no, you're a person, you're equal, and I overtrained them. <laughs> Particularly Beth, and she thinks that she's in charge of stuff, you know. So I overtrained him. <laughs> you did a too good a job. <laughs> ah, well, I guess so. <laughs> uh, okay, we we talked about the prayer breakfast and uh, how how that got started, and uh, the th I think it's amazing that it is still going here. Some. Well, it wouldn't be if it wasn't for Preston. 
Yes, that's right. It would not be if, if it wasn't for Preston Trimble still yeah. there at the at the uh, at the helm of it. Um, we've already talked about Bill Haynes. What about Tom Wilson? Tom Tom uh, was uh, Uncle Tom. Uh, Tom had a twin brother, and uh, Patty taught school with uh, a, a niece of Tom's. And Tom and I were ushers together, and that's yes. how I got acquainted with I him. See. He was an usher for <coughs> as long as oh, I was associated with him, McFarland. Mm -hmm. He was a, an right. usher there. He always was. And a, and a gardener. He, okay. he had uh, air, squash and tomatoes and, and, and everything. Mm -hmm. Quite a gardener. He lived up just north up here. Yeah, yeah. he was right along in here somewhere close yeah. by. Mm -hmm. You know what, what I remember about Tom saying as far as ushering, you have two steps to get in so that you're in step with everybody when you go down the aisle to take the place down. Yeah. yeah. Second step, you better be in step. Well, <laughs> see, the, the, uh, the ushers all sat at the back, and that's, we had chairs back at the back, and we, that's whenever <coughs> we finished our job, we'd go back there and sit. So I, I spend a lot of Sundays with uh, Tom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how about George Martin? George was a beautiful person, and he talked with a real low voice, and he sang well, you know. And uh, he he was a real active in the, in the men's prayer break. Oh, was he? I didn't realize Just, that. Yeah. yeah, and and uh, well, we had. We had quite a few uh, uh, famous people over the years. I've maintained a, and I'm going to give you this is this is this is chapter one oh. of uh, the men's prayer breakfast. Oh my goodness! This is uh, wow. All of the stuff and and uh, the uh, we have. Uh, it's men's. It's McFarland Church men's prayer breakfast. Ladies welcome, and yes. it's always been that mm -hmm. way. And uh, we had we had one woman that was uh, on the list, cooking uh, list. Really? Yeah, Chris Laney. That uh, Chris Laney. Bi Chris Laney, yeah. Bill Laney's uh, daughter. Okay. She was. She appeared. I, I knew a Joy Laney. Is that the same? Chris. No, no, okay, I was going to say, I knew a Joy Laney. I don't know if that was yeah. really related. And uh, so I've got all oh, of these goodness. 1981. That's a treasure. We'll be oh, Victor, Victor Agabi Davies, he, uh, he was from Nigeria. And uh, the story is you can't get off the list. Once you right. get off the list, the only way you can get off is die. Because uh -huh. Victor went back to Nigeria, and then and he would come back, and we'd he'd make him cook, you know, <laughs> he got yeah. back from Nigeria. And I don't think we have mentioned specifically in so many words that this was definitely interdenominational from the beginning. Oh yes, oh yes. We we've always had uh, interdenominational. How did you first get the word out that to other people from other churches that this that they were welcome that this was interdenominational. I just subpoenaed them. I was a DA and judge and county attorney and I stuff. See. And so you were in a good position to see people and invite them. Order them. <laughs> 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 no, we had, and I would I w we would have the ladies, uh, and I would subpoena issue subpoenas for them. <laughs> you want to tell them about the fish fries that you used to have on breakfast? Breakfast fish fries, was it? It's a, a quail breakfast. Quail, that's right. Yeah. Fish. It was quail, quail breakfast. Right. Quail oh, who breakfast. Did, now, who did that? <clears throat> Pardon? Who did the quail breakfast? You? Oh, yeah. Okay. You, well, you must that, be, that you must like hunting. That is other subject, uh, dogs. Yeah. You want to tell about that? Uh, well, I've had lots of dogs. And uh, they, they, uh, still have lots of dogs you know it's field trialing now horses and dogs and so do you live in the country no just live in, in town. town you're able to have have the, the dogs and the, and the horses yeah well uh my 
longtime hunting buddy, Enos Seymour, lives out east of town. Oh, I see. He has property out there, and I keep uh, horses there. I see. Trailer. Who, who do you take with you when you go on the dog hunt, I think? My granddaughter. This is, uh, uh, in the summertime, I send my dogs and horses up to North Dakota. Oh. Yeah, and uh, for, uh, for a long time, uh, I've been going up there. The field trials start up there in, uh, Wednesday after Labor Day. And so, uh, North Dakota, prior to the oil boom, which changed a lot, people in North Dakota left their keys in the pickup because your neighbor may need them, you need it, you know, and didn't lock their doors or anything. That all changed when the boom came. And at any rate, uh, my, uh, Patty and I were there 9-11. We were in North Dakota 9-11, but we had driven up so we could come home. A lot of people were up there to the field trials and, and they couldn't, couldn't get a plane, you know, oh. couldn't get out. They grounded mm -hmm. everybody. And so my granddaughter, Bethy's daughter, uh, started going up where, with me whenever she was nine years old uh -huh. or ten, maybe, something like that. And there, nobody lived up there, so she learned how to drive. <laughs> looking over the, she had to stretch up to look over the deal, but there was nobody on the roads. And so I, I have a habit of overtraining my female <laughs> so, uh, friends and uh, family. And so I said, well, honey, it's flat up there, but there are some little hills and it's just gravel roads and stuff. And so I say, when you're getting on this road uh, and you, this hill here, you get over to the side because you can't see that it's one lane, you know, and you can't see somebody come from the other side. So uh, I overtrained her because if she had see a hill in Montana, she would get over to the <laughs> side, you know. <laughs> oh. But she's been going up there with me. For, and, and we go up, stay at the same place, you know. To, and the, the, uh, it's a fascinating, beautiful bunch of people live up there. And we got acquainted with them, and they, and they have a fish fry on Friday, and then a, mm -hmm. a, a banquet at the country club on Saturday. And uh, the country club is a nine-hole golf course with AstroTurf greens, you know. But it's just beautiful people up there. And again, Emily gets to demonstrate how nice she is. Uh-huh. Great. She's a second year She's law student. She's the one who comes to the prayer breakfast. Yeah. Um, she introduces uh, Dr. Mark. Yeah. You say yeah. she's uh, in law school now? Yeah, she's second she's year She's following law your footsteps, huh? Well, uh, I, sure, I'm going to claim. <laughs> <laughs> are there any others? That are she's in your kind of are? independent, although, uh, no, no others. You know, Preston, you, you, you neglected to mention judgeship, and you also talk about you were a colonel. Well, I, I liked the military, uh, but I, I was in, when we were in Korea, <clears throat> I, was, I was on a destroyer, and uh, when I was in Korea, I got bored, and so I learned Morse code. And the next thing I know, I'm out on the bridge doing signal <laughs> oh. work, you know, and, uh, and, and it was cold in North <laughs> Korea. And uh, so I liked the military, three square meals a day, and, uh, uh, well, in, in my job, Recidivism is a real problem for a lot of people. They can understand somebody possibly going to prison first time. Well, why would they go back again, you know? And I, I was very well acquainted with recidivism. <coughs> you know, uh, I, I didn't have any money, and, and in 
uh, lots of ports, we weren't welcome. All they had was beer joints and, and you know, and I didn't drink and so uh, I just stayed on board rather than go, go ashore. <coughs> All of my friends were on the ship. All of my worldly possessions were on the ship. I was comfortable on the ship, knew the rules, etc. Why would I want to go ashore? Well, the same thing when the guy goes to prison, he comes back out. You don't want him living next door to you. You don't want to hire him. And so all his friends are back in prison. So mm -hmm. it's no problem for him to go back to prison. Mm -hmm. Well, I liked the military, but I didn't like much being enlisted because I was, uh, had those, when we were in Korea, we had four on, four off, four on, four off, four on, four off. And the next thing you know, you're a zombie, you know. And I'm, uh, my watch is on the bridge, but to go to the bridge, you have to go through green country, officer's country. And there would be a guy was sitting about maybe three or four years older than you are, and he's having a bowl of cereal or something, you know. And the mess halls closed for us. So I liked the military, and uh, uh, but I but I wanted to be an officer. So I came back and uh, to OU, and I uh, went through Air Force ROTC, and ended up being the wing commander of the Air Force ROTC. And that was back in the days whenever uh, 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 freshmen and sophomores had to go to uh, Air Force Land Grant College, they had to go to, to ROTC and end up being wing commander. And at that time, Norman was, uh, well, the Navy base was here at Norman and it was a dry state and they had an officer's club on the south base where Reeves Park is now. And uh, as, an, as a reservist, uh, you could belong to the officer's club, which is kind of the center of social life in Norman. And so I did that. And then I started flying airplanes, and they had a uh, reserve, uh, air, air reserve outfit up on the north base. And so I could fly, as a reservist, I could fly space available and these guys had to go up and bore holes, you know, ever uh, so many hours a month. And so I could ride space available with them, and they really taught me how to fly. Uh, Gene Jones, who was a member of McFarland Church, was a member of that. And uh, Tommy Evans, the baseball or uh, uh, wrestling coach at OU, oh. uh, taught me how to And they, they, would, they really taught me how to fly because uh, they had two types of planes up there. One's a, a bird dog, and, and and the other was a big old uh, De Havilland uh, plane that they they haul. It could, if you could put this building in it, it would take off with that <laughs> on it. And uh, it would, they would do things like. Uh, trim it up so, and, and it said, okay, you got it, and the <laughs> stick would hit me, you know, and the plane would go up, and, and uh, or, or they would, I would be reaching down in my flight suit to get something, and they'd say, it's all yours, I'm looking up at the ground, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. And so I got interested in that, and, and uh, first thing you know, uh, 15 years is over, well, you might as well stay on, you know, and ended up uh, being a uh, colonel in the Air Force Reserve, uh, hustling a star, and uh, so I had the uh, deputy TJ uh, in Norman with, uh, and he is on Armed Forces Day, and he spoke to the combined clubs, uh, civic clubs, <coughs> and, I, and I would go back and do uh, uh, active duty at the Pentagon, and uh, I, I had a 
a, a buddy that was uh, a U.S. senator from uh, Vermont, uh, uh, Patrick Leahy. There's pictures of Patrick here. Uh, and uh, so I, I would have uh, I, 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 the deputy TJAG over to the Senate dining room. I wouldn't have it, but Patrick would. Uh, he was an old DA friend of mine from Burlington, Vermont. And uh, so I was hustling that star. But this deputy TJAG got an offer from Duke University to go back and teach law school. He retired. So the next guy came along, had his own. Yeah. But you don't have the military work. Right, I know. Uh -huh. yeah, he had his own job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about the judgeship here at Norman? That they call him judge. They always call him uh, judge. That's what I, I've yeah. noticed that the, everybody refers to you as the judge. Yeah. The uh, father, father uh, Goins was uh, at mass last Sunday. It was about the uh, the uh, homily was about the evil judge who the widow had to keep knocking on his door for mm -hmm. to give a judge and and Father Goins was saying, Well, at the early mass today we had a judge, but we don't have one now. And then he was and then he, he stood and said, Yeah, we do have a judge. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Was that the elected position when you were elected judge? Yes. And uh I I uh, I was a judge for 12 years, and then uh, in uh, 1990 uh, there was a, a, a expulsion of everybody who was in office. There were seven people who ran for re-election here in Cleveland County. All of us were defeated. All of us. They mm -hmm. voted the rascals out. Wow. <laughs> and, well, that was all over the country. Yeah. They did that all over the country. Uh -huh. And uh, the, the guy that ran against me, uh, within a year, he was kicked out of office by the court on the judiciary with 63 counts of misfeasance, malfeasance, and nonfeasance. Oh, my. And, and uh, but the election was going on and the girls were really concerned that they, they came down, you know, from Oklahoma City and, and, and how's dad doing, you know, and everything. And Patty says, uh, I guess he's doing okay in bed. He got to go to work tomorrow. <laughs> so, you know, uh -huh. and uh, so, uh, and, and as a matter of fact, it has, uh, it was probably the best thing ever happened. To, well, no, certainly the best thing ever happened to me financially. I was only going to run one more time because then I could judge, then I could uh, gather the DA and the judge's retirement together. Uh -huh. And with old militaries, you think about retirement and, you know, that income and stuff. And so that was why I was running again. And so, uh, I had a, had a guy call me the day after the election and he said, uh, I'm glad you lost. I worked real hard to make sure that you didn't win the uh -huh. election because you took my daughter's baby away from her. At that time I could have said, sir, you know, judges don't take babies away from their mothers unless their mother is some kind of bottom feeder. I didn't. I said, congratulations, you won, goodbye, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, as it turned out, financially and, and every other way, uh, being, being defeated was the best thing ever happened to me, mm -hmm. financially. Yeah. Well, that's that's an interesting philosophy because uh, it's it's the, what they tell you is that you know trust in the Lord, things can change if you make make it positive. Yeah. No matter no matter how how bad it seems at the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Well, uh, uh, 
we had a report last Wednesday about one of our members that is uh, uh, the last devotion he gave at the uh, men's prayer breakfast. He talked about uh, his wife left him and he got down on his knees and he prayed. But at that same meeting he was reporting about they'd lost, they'd, she'd gone and uh, that he had just adopted a baby. He and his new wife had just adopted mm -hmm. a baby. And uh, <clears throat> so after it was, the devotion was over with, I said, called his name, said, thank God for unanswered prayers. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, I have come to the end of my list uh, I know you had some notes there. Did you have anything else on your notes that we haven't talked about? Oh, I was just going to comment about some of the some of the people there. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, you you've covered about everything that I was. I was just going to name some Robert St. John, Bill Denver. Yeah, tell, tell us about Robert St. John. He he uh, was one of the original guys. He didn't uh, do the devotion. Uh, it wasn't on the first, uh, but he was—he's been around forever. Herb O'Neill was a, a guy who, uh, because of my ability to sing, <laughs> or let me rephrase that, because I started out picking the song. I picked the song every Wednesday, you know, and. Uh, I only, I'm limited in the Cokesbury hymnal about know which ones I know. And so Herb O'Neill, uh, uh, who's a, a reservist, retired, etc., he, uh, he used to predict which song I was going to sing. So, so if, I, if he predicted it, I bought his breakfast for him. <laughs> Back in those days, it was 50 cents. Uh. And John Abbott was a character, and when we were in Meyer Hall, we made, uh, had the coffee maker, and so John would show up uh, every morning and make coffee. Uh -huh. And it was very possessive of that coffee pot. Yes. Oh, yeah. You know, oh, I, I can remember that when I first, the first time I was the chief cook and bottle washer. I remember that. Yeah. I, I've got to tell you this about John. Uh, the... Uh, church uh, was having a, a new um, picture calendar, a picture addiction, uh, what do you call it, Dr a directory. directory made. They didn't have a picture of John Abbott because he was unable to come in. They asked me to go visit him. I went to his house to visit, you know, and take the picture and everything. I spent over oh, probably close to an hour visiting with him. He died that night. Yeah. But uh, I felt that again is sometimes like I say that I feel that we're meant to do things and that was one of the things I yeah. felt I was meant to do was go yeah. visit with him. Well we have a it's a unique crowd I mean we we know each other pretty yeah. well and we meet together every Wednesday and we have a you know I know Joe's going to show up and put out the, uh, yeah. the jelly and the <laughs> you know and uh, we, we have a, a fraternity, if you will, uh, and like for people who are ill uh, or uh, have or some prop, whatever it might happen to be, uh, and we send them a sympathy card. Now our sympathy card <laughs> is a napkin okay. and we pour a little coffee on it, put a little grease on it, and all <laughs> sign it, and send this napkin to our aggrieved member. Uh -huh. And that's been historic from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's a great fellowship, great fellowship. And uh, by the way, you're welcome to come anytime. Okay. 
if I could ever get up that early. <laughs> I shouldn't say that anymore. I'm always awake that early anymore. <laughs> well, uh, I think we have probably covered it. It's certainly been an interesting session. I appreciate all the memories you've shared. And, uh, uh, I'm sure that I will remember something that I wanted to share with yeah. you as soon as well, you turn off the camera. And I have just thought of one question that I'd like to ask at the end of this. What, what do you hope to see uh, in modern Christianity? What do you hope to see come in the coming years for Christianity? I, I, uh, I hope to see us pattern more of our life about Christ. The, way Christ lived his life. The, uh, I, I am distressed about uh, people who, who are elected officials who are more concerned about themselves than they are about the public. Uh, I made my living for 30 years running for political office. I wouldn't run for election today. I wouldn't want my grandkids to see a flyer which proves that I'm a lying, cheating thief. And that's the way it is now. When I ran for county attorney, Harold Heipel ran and I ran for the office. And uh, uh, Harold and I go to the same church. We talk every Sunday. We're friends. You know, my, my campaign was I've been an assistant county attorney and Harold hasn't. So I think I'm better trained for it than, than he is. Not uh, Harold is X, Y, Z, etc., etc. And that's what you see today, you know. Uh, when I ran for uh, district attorney, uh, I, I probated the estate of the person who ran against me. Twenty years later, thirty years later, forty years later, yeah. you know, and. Uh, it's changed so much. I mean, I, I, I would hope that, and, and there's so much, you know, <clears throat> when we moved to California, we were illegal aliens because we weren't welcome. Yeah. Ogie, Okies, Arkies, and Texicans were not welcome because we took jobs without we. I'm five years old, but my dad took jobs that were available out there. <clears throat> and if you'll remember the, the Grapes of Rat, the people coming in would take 25 cents for a bushel of peaches. <coughs> they were out there, they were paying them 50 cents, you know. And so where illegal aliens were uh, unwelcome. So I, I think brotherhood, uh, <coughs> uh, lighten up America. Good. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I guess that we'll let Joe turn off the camera now. Okay.